All right, without further ado, my name is Eric Metzoning. I'm a law practice management advisor. I have been in law practice management for a long time. I graduated from law school in 96. I practiced law for about 10 years, the last many of which were uh, as the managing partner of a fast growing family law firm in North Carolina. And after that, since uh, about 2006, I've been more or less engaged in practice management, coaching and consulting for lawyers since then. I did it for a long time at the North Carolina Bar Association where I was the founding director of the Center for Practice Management. I currently have my own company called OutManage. Um, I work with private clients, but I also do a lot of work with Lawyers Mutual Liabilities Insured. So those of you who are insured by Lawyers Mutual and are in North Carolina, um, feel free to connect with me later as a benefit of your insurance. You're able to consult with me for free three times a year, which is really nice. Um, but anyway, so I spend a lot of my time talking to lawyers in private practice, mostly in small and mid-sized firms about issues related to practice management. So um, technology, marketing, management, finance, all that kind of stuff. And today we're gonna to talk about key performance indicators and uh, which are like a basic tool for, for law firm management. And so the first thing I, I like to sort of set the, the table with when I talk about um, KPIs is to think of your car dashboard, because I think that's the handiest metaphor for getting your head around it. Like the last, when you drove to your office or wherever you are today, or the last time you were in a car, you're driving down a road and it, you imagine if the only thing on your dashboard was your gas gauge. Like you would know how far you could go generally, like whether you're going to be out of gas, but you'd have no idea whether the engine was overheating. You'd have no idea how fast you're going, whether you were speeding and so on and so forth. Same thing with speedometer. If you had just a speedometer, you would be pretty clear you're not going to get a speeding ticket, but you might run out of gas somewhere or any other number of things might go wrong. Point being here that there are a handful, more than one, um, key numbers that it's worth keeping an eye on when you're running a small law firm at the same time. Um, but a, a startling number of folks run their law firms looking at either no dashboard or like a single numerical dashboard, the most common of which I, when I talk with lawyers and small law firms is they know how much gross revenue they made the month or the year prior. And it's good for, you know, like when the money's run out, you know, then time to go make more money. It's like, okay, that's good. It's like your gas gauge. It's like, it's an important thing to keep an eye on, but it's, um, you know, like it's the most rudimentary thing to, to sort of build on. So today we're gonna talk about a few other things about how you can conceptualize KPIs and what you might do in your near law firms. Okay, so first, we're going to, the, here's what we're going to go through today. We're going to talk about what is a KPI, why do they matter, what functional areas in your firm can benefit from KPIs, how many should you have, and then at the end, I'll give you a little starter pack of some ideas of things that I think are, are useful for small firms, especially new firms to consider. Okay, hang on, I just got to move everybody here on top of my thing there. Okay, so four components of a KPI. What What is a KPI? All right. The first thing is it's got to be key or it's important. There, it, is, uh, it goes without saying probably, but there is no point in keeping track of a metric that isn't one that drives an important chunk of what makes your world work. So um, first thing is when you're looking at key performance indicators is you want to pick something important. Second is you want it to be quantifiable and measurable. Doesn't do you much good if it's really important, but there's no way to track it other than feels like it's going pretty well, feels like it's not going that well. Like you can imagine something like how, uh, you know, how's your the management of your new associate going? Um, that would be a hard thing in a lot of ways to to quantify. And if you might feel like that's oh, going pretty well. They're they're making good progress, or it's not going that well. They're they're being slow. It's like, it's an important thing to know, but it would be hard to turn that into a KPI because there's not, it's, it'd be hard to turn it into something quantifiable. So important, quantifiable. Third is ideally you want it to be a metric of progress. What that means is like, it needs to tie into some kind of goal. Like, what are you trying to do 
And how does the KPI relate to the thing you're trying to do? It's it, If they're just sitting on an island and it's just a little number that you keep track of that doesn't connect to the, the parts of your business that you're paying attention to or your goals that you're trying to achieve, it doesn't do you much good. And the last piece I, I sort of already said, toward an established goal, target, or result. So you want something important. You want something quantifiable. You want something that measures progress and you want it to be toward a, a goal or a target. Okay, so that's that's the big picture on that. Okay. Um, all right. Why do they matter? Okay, for a few reasons. And a lot of these are, are analogous to why does a dashboard matter in a car? And that's why I started out talking about that kind of stuff. Number one is they help you monitor progress. It's good to know how you're doing against you. Let's say you set a goal that, you know, this year my firm is going to make $250,000 of revenue. It's really helpful if you know in March and you know in April and you know in June how you're doing towards that goal and you don't wait until December 31st to find out how close or far you were from it. So monitoring progress is, uh, is an important part of it. Um, it also, y'all probably heard that old saying about management that that which gets measured gets done and so like when you keep an eye on things not only does it help you um, know how you're doing against your goal but it also increases the likelihood that you're going to remember to, to focus on those things and and all of that stuff it's a place where you put your attention okay Second is it helps you identify problems. You know, if you're off track, you can plot out, you've got your, you know, I'm trying to get to $250,000. We're at the end of quarter two, we're halfway through the year, I should be somewhere around 125,000. And I'm, you know, at only 100,000, I'm pretty substantially behind, and it helps you stop and say, okay, there's something going on here, let me drill down and, and figure out what's compromising my ability to reach that goal. Third thing is it helps you focus on priorities. You all mentioned when we were getting started that uh, you know somebody is not going to be here today because they're swamped, and it's like, yeah, that's life in a small practice. That's like, and let alone all of the many things that crowd in from you know actual life. Like running a law a law practice is an unfairly punishingly difficult thing to do. You have to like be learning to be a lawyer. You have to be you know learning to like handle clients well, and you have to run a, a business at the same time. That is a lot of stuff to be to be focusing and to be having to balance at the same time. So one of the things KPIs does for you is it allows you to stop in a moment of reflection, say in an annual review or whatever, decide what your priorities are for that year. And then the KPIs help you focus on them because it's super hard on July 12th when the, you know, you have an angry client and your mom's sick and you know, you made less revenue this month than you, than you expected, it can be easy to lose focus on your actual priorities. So focusing on priorities is helpful. Um, align teams. So Nikia, I think you mentioned you're in a three person law firm. And so one of the key things that a KPI does is it helps you get everybody on the, you know, on this working off the same sheet of paper. Like, okay, these are our goals. These are how we measure our goals. This is how we know whether we're all doing well or not. Because once you have more than just you in a law firm, once you have three people, it, you know, it, you say ready, set, go, and everybody runs off in their own direction. <laughs> it um, gets a lot harder to actually achieve the things you wanna achieve if you don't have everybody focused on the same things and aligned against those priorities. Hey, and then lastly, Eric, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry if I could interrupt you, and I'm, you I bet. don't um, mean to put Nakia on the spot, but I'm just curious to, to the point you were just talking about. Nakia, with it being in a three attorney law firm, like, do you have regular reports or is that something I, I know your law firm's relatively new, so you're still figuring out systems and programs, but like, um, is what Eric's saying, does it resonate? Is it something that you guys have started doing or you want to be doing or how it's, have you used? Yeah. Right. So it's something that we're we're absolutely planning on doing, but actually getting our deciding how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it has, has been a little bit of a, of a struggle, in part because we are all 
like Eric said, different places, running off, you know, doing different things. And so, although we meet regularly, um, a lot of other things have just been taking priority. So it's something we're getting back to. We were literally talking about it at our Monday meeting <laughs> three days ago. So we're working yeah. towards it. Well, totally, Nikki. I get, I get that. It, it, it's hard to make time for it. And it's like, all this stuff is the very definition of the things that are important, but not urgent. You know, like you can get through this week, this month, this year without doing this and everybody will live, you know, um, but you'll be better off. Like eventually you will be better off if you, if you do it. It sounds like you guys have already had your hands around that. Um, so uh, last piece about why the KPIs matter. They help you to make data-driven decisions. So you guys aren't just, you know, working from feelings or, you know, beliefs or uh, other things like that. Um, so um, just to make sure that we're all sort of uh, uh, in the same place on this, like, does all that make sense so far in terms of what I've talked about? Like the, why the KPIs matter? Like any confusion on any of this stuff that we've covered so far? Good, all right. No. Okay, cool, I'll move on. All right. In your firm, which functional areas would benefit from KPIs? Well, I'd be a, an advocate for all of your main functional areas, which I'd break up as business development or sales and marketing, whatever you call it. I always think of it as business development in a firm. Case management, which I think of as the stuff that happens from the time a client signs up to the time that their case is closed. So all the, the legal work and the you know overseeing of that that happens billing like the practices for how you actually bill them and collect and all that stuff and then operations so everything that is not marketing and is not working on the case all the other stuff that happens um, in the law firm uh, goes under the heading of operations and all of these areas could benefit from having a kpi or two how many should you have and so um once you start going down this path, like at a lot of lawyers, it it gets kind of interesting. Like once you start drilling into the data and you like, it's kind of fun and you're like, oh, and if I figured this out and not like I can get this data and blah, blah, blah. And there comes a moment in the life of every firm where they decided it's like, you know, what would be great if we had 92 key performance indicators and uh, it, it's a totally natural thing to do because it gets a little bit addictive once you sort of get into the habit of drilling into it. But I, I'm an advocate uh, in this case for keep this really, really restrained. So especially Nikki, you know, a firm like yours where you're just starting to get this set up, I would say you want to have enough that cover your, your key goals, but you want to have few enough that you can remember them. Okay. So if you have to like look at a sheet of paper to remember what your KPIs are, you have too many. Like this needs to be something that it's like, if you got stopped on the street in the middle of a hairy, busy day and somebody said, what are your two KPIs for the firm? You'd be able to say they're A and they're B. Like they should be top of mind and that's what makes them, them key. I would say no more as, as a guardrail on this, don't have any more than two per those functional areas that I mentioned. Anything more than that, I think you're gonna exceed the amount of brain space you need to a lot for this. And if you're gonna just, uh, if you're starting from jump, I would say start with two for the entire firm. And that's a really small, reasonable step to make. And if you guys can do that, you will be in six months and nine months and 12 months, you'll be far better off than you would be if you, if you didn't do it. So does all that make sense so far? Okay, all right. So here's what I'm gonna put in the KPI starter pack and I'm almost done talking and then we can have conversation about it. So under business development, um, one of the things that I think is really useful is an initial consultation conversion rate, meaning when you sit down with a, an initial consult for the first time, how often do they hire you versus how often do they decide to go hire somebody else or not go forward with it at all? We can unpack that. I work with a lot of lawyers on this stuff and they like very frequently tell me proudly that they have 100% of the people they sit down with uh, retain 100%. My closing rate is 100% on that. And that's not a great sign. It's a sign that you're probably underpriced, for example, like if you're, if you're getting 100% of it. And so there's, there's stuff to talk about there, but it starts with knowing the number. Um, second is billing. 
know how much you build, they know how much you've collected. Um, those things are, are pretty important numbers. In case management, these vary so widely from practice area to practice area. I'll just say the one that cuts across all of the things that a small private firm does is figure out how you're gonna do client satisfaction. Like know what your client, because every single one of you is going that if you have a firm that produces satisfied clients, your firm will grow. And if you have a firm that doesn't produce satisfied clients, your firm will not grow. And that is the, the sort of the flywheel on how a firm moves forward. Like there, there is no shortcut or hack that gets you around producing satisfied clients. So we can unpack this in a little bit if you'd like to talk about it, but I'm, uh, I like to start law firms, my clients off with um, net promoter score as the way to take client satisfaction and turn that into a, an actionable metric. Net promoter score is a one question survey and I'm, I'm happy to discuss that if that's something of interest. But I'll just finish this last thing. And then um, the last piece of, of in the starter pack in operations would be overhead. It's just know what percentage out of every dollar, how many cents out of every dollar goes to keeping the lights on and paying for the computers and paying for the software and all of that stuff. There's a number at which it crowds out your ability to pay yourself well, to pay associates well, to pay to, to have the kind of healthy financial firm you want. And then there's a number at which maybe it's too lean and you're not investing enough if you're not growing fast enough. And so having like uh, figuring out your overhead is a is a key performance number that I would keep an eye on. So th that would be my starter pack. If I was starting, like when you guys, Nikia, sit down and try to think about where you want to go, it, I would start with two and I would pick two out of here that you feel like will help you guys uh, move your firm forward. Collections and client satisfaction would be the two I would pick because I think if you didn't look at anything else, if you know how much you're actually bringing in and you know how satisfied your clients are, you have a really good chance of being, uh, you know, having a better next year than you did this year. Okay, I'm going to share with Mark this uh, deck, so we don't need to go over this. A lot of this is going to be a little bit deep for you all in the in the early stages, but I'm just going to put them in there and, and, and then you can go through the deck and I'm always happy to talk to you about any of this, but these are sort of next level cuts for what you might, other KPIs that you might look at. Um, it's not really necessary to go into here, but there's a lot of stuff like once you start driving into, into this that are, that's really interesting uh, about how you run a successful firm. Okay, so that that's sort of a 40,000 foot view. Um, I'm happy now to like just have talk about it or, um, or let y'all go to have your lunches, whatever, whatever you want. No, this is this is my love language, Eric. Um, I love this stuff. <laughs> this is what I did for I bet, yeah. 20 plus years at Kimley Horn. Um, yeah, yeah, you guys yeah, probably so it, lived, had a lot of metrics there. Yeah, and but it's interesting, exactly to your point, we had a lot of metrics, but there were always a small handful that that once you knew what you were looking at, you would zero in on those three or four, you know, AR over right. 90, utilization right. rates, um, uh, multiple, we had a thing called multiplier, which was your, basically your billable rate divided by your labor cost. Mm -hmm. um, and in our industry, that multiplier, if you were above a three, so if I was paying myself, if my hourly salary cost was $33 an hour and I was billing out at $100 an hour, it was pretty good. Anything over three was good and approaching four was great. Most law firms probably have that multiplier is about six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I'm guessing, but um, just have different multipliers. So, um, yeah, yeah, if, if you... I can bounce back to you on that, Mark, I would say that one of the things when I talk to, to clients about this is. I basically turn that the that multiplier metric on its head, and instead of talking about it as a multiplier for um, from an employee perspective, from a firm owner perspective, I think I, I try to encourage folks to think about it as what percentage of each dollar do you have to spend for a lawyer to produce legal work, and what mm -hmm. percentage do you have, which is the same thing, right? It's the inversion of that, mm -hmm. and so like if you have a four to one multiplier, it's a twenty five percent of the legal of each dollar is spent to produce the legal work right um and so um 
there's a, a number in there, you know, again, like that you, you have to uh, account for your overhead. You have to account for your profit, you know, because at the end of the day, it's nice if you're making some profit for just owning the firm apart from your work, but also, um, you know, uh, making sure that people are being paid if, you know, for uh, the marketing or business development pieces of it. So like, it's a really handy thing to, to be able to get your head around. And so I've seen it as low as about 20% in a law firm. And I've seen it as, I mean, I've seen law firms paying associates over 50% of what they collect. Um, and so somewhere in there is the, is the range. But I think it's, it's really interesting because it's a, like a sort of a, it's the inverse of how y'all did it at Kim Lee Horn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the key and T, if y'all have questions, y'all feel free to jump in. But maybe you could talk about that um, net promoter score a little bit, the client satisfaction. Just, um... You bet. Yeah, let me give you like a, a, a real quick survey course in that. So first of all, net promoter score. If you guys Google search this, you will find 1 billion articles and books on this topic. It's uh, There's a million things to read on it. But let me give you sort of the the quick and dirty synopsis of this. It is basically a one question survey. It is truly designed to measure um, client loyal or customer loyalty, but I think it works really well um, for it, for law firms for client satisfaction. I've done it for many years and I, I find it to be a really helpful thing um, for a bunch of reasons. So the, the single question that you ask is some version of um, how likely are you to, to recommend to friends or, you know, family members or loved ones or whatever the appropriate verbiage is, you know, colleagues um, to use our law firm? And um, you can ask that multiple times throughout the, the course of the representation. You can ask it at the end. Um, it provides really helpful barometer and you can um, you ask them to pick a number between zero and 10, 10 being extremely likely zero being absolutely not. Um, there's a lot to read on this. There's a lot of smart people from Harvard Business School spending lots and lots of time unpacking the like the details of how to interpret this, but the, the sort of the 40,000 foot view is that you wanna get nines or tens. If you're not getting nines or tens, you're probably not getting referrals. Like once you get to eight, seven, six, these are folks who are lukewarm about you. You get to six, they are not fans. And so nines or tens are people, are clients who are going to say, oh my God, you need an estate planner? You need to call my estate planner. She was absolutely terrific. And that's what you want because in a, in a startup firm, that's the difference between a bigger next year and a smaller next year is when your clients do your marketing for you. Um, so so there's a lot more that we could talk about with it, but I'll say like, you can do this by email um, to your clients, send, send out just like super, I always will put in the subject line, super quick uh, feedback or super quick question, like to emphasize that this is not gonna take long because we all have like massive survey fatigue for, you know, can you do this for me? And then it takes 20 minutes and you're clicking through 18 screens and just like that one line on there and let them reply just in line in the survey, I mean, in the email. Um, so that they don't have to go anywhere, do anything, just like nine, thanks, you know, and, and you're done. So one of the things that's magical about that is the response rate on this kind of survey is through the roof. Like it pretty much everybody will respond to this. You get like easy, get an 80, 85, 90% response rate, which is pretty hard to do in surveys. Um, it's just hard to cut through. It also is an awesome early warning system. Like you do this, let's say 90 days into a, into a matter or 60 days into a matter with somebody and they say six, especially if you have like an associate working on it or whatever, it's like, you know, something's wrong. And you can pick up the phone and say, it gives you a great way to have that entree and say like, hey, I just got your result. I was really sorry to hear that um, it was a six. Help, what's going on? How can I help get this on track? And, um, and before you know it, you're, you're finding out something that was going wrong so that you can fix it before they call and say, I'm done with this firm. Give me my money back. I'm going to hire somebody else. So, yeah, so to, to that, I'm sorry, to that, to that point, yeah. I, I guess I had assumed that would be done at the conclusion of a matter, but that example is 
you could do it midway through a, a matter and not just at the end, but midway through. Yeah. So at the end would be great for knowing how things ended up. But um, so at, in the deep cuts uh, of the metrics, one of the things I, I suggest to people is they keep track of how old their cases are, like how, how much they age. And so once you have a sense of like, I do estate plans and my estate plans last 180 days on average, you know, or whatever. Once you know how long your cases last, your matters last, then I think it would it is well worth your time to do it somewhere at a key juncture around halfway. So you can get, or, so you can get a, you know, insight as to how this is going. Um, it's really, really helpful to know. And um, it will enable you to address problems before they fester. Do you, you can, yeah, sorry. do you, um, how does that work when you, the majority of your clients are long-termers? Um, yeah. So if you have long-term clients, then you might just do this on a calendar basis and figure out like, what is the appropriate uh, interval on this? You don't want to do it like every five years. It's way too much time for someone to wander away, but you don't want to do it every month with somebody that you want to have be a client for 10 plus years. So I think figuring this out is a little bit of art in terms of the timing, um, you know, but like easy, you could make an argument once a year would be fine to check in and you might even dress it up a little bit like with, you know, hey, just checking in, um, you know, it's been a year, blah, 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 just a quick, real quick question for you, asking all the clients to make sure everything's okay. And then you ask your question. Would quarterly um, be too often? Well, that's entirely up to your clients. And like one of the things you can take a look at is you could start it with quarterly or you could start it with half a year and see what your response rate is like. They will tell you in the form of not answering as to whether you're asking too much. So if you go to quarterly and your response rate drops to say 60%, it's a less valuable survey than if you were doing it at the half year and your response rate was 90%. Because the, the coin of the realm in surveys is response rate. Like not like the data is the, it, it, the data set is the entire game. And so even if you have, that's why I'm an advocate for like, keep it as lightweight as possible for the clients. Don't make them go to a, like a special website. Don't make them, you know, click through too many things or create a username. Just let them reply and write one single digit and reply in the email. And you can have somebody on your end compile it into a spreadsheet. It's like, it's not that much work. I'm sorry, okay, I'm, I'm another, not hearing. I wasn't hearing you, sorry. I was muted, I'm sorry. So oh, I get, okay. uh, the, the next question would be, how does that play into the fact that nowadays everybody says that it, one of the best ways um, or one of the best means, I guess, of business development is getting online reviews, like on mm -hmm. Google, Yelp, those types of things. So. <laughs> how do those two, how do those how, two how interact? Does, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of thoughts on that. First, I don't quote me on this, but follow up on it. Do y'all, do y'all have a professional responsibility person coming to talk to you guys, uh, Mark? Uh, Nicole McLaughlin from the state bar okay, talked great. to us uh, a couple months ago, but maybe, she, well, I don't know what you had in mind that she should have or could have talked about, but she, she did talk well, to us. Yeah. And I'm happy to give you some other like folks that would be happy to, to talk with you all. But what, I'm, what I was about to say is some states, some places, can't remember North Carolina, whether it's one of them, have rules around soliciting online reviews, specifically like if you're allowed to only ask a subset of your clients versus having to uh, uh, ask everybody. I don't know the answer to that. I don't remember, but this is a question that should be put to a professional responsibility lawyer on that so that you're coloring inside the lines. But um, so with that as an aside, um, so ideally what you want is like, the online review comes is the last thing you want here. It's like this comes at the tail end of when you've uh, reached a point where you're confident you have uh, a happy client. And at that point, you might you might ask for like you might bring them in for a day and or a half a day or something and have them do an online review and do a video testimonial and turn that like and 
turn the review and the testimonial and, and a written testimonial and like bundle all of those things up. Um, but if you have long-term clients, uh, like as opposed to episodic clients, like in a family law firm or whatever, you're going to need to like look for opportunities to have that conversation um, so that it fits into the, the life of that, that client matter. Um, so you could, you know, do something to like recognize a client. It's like, you've been a client of the firm for X number of years. We wanted to, you know, say thank you. And here's blah, blah, blah. You know, something that opens this conversation, you know, um, but otherwise you're just, you're looking for moments where you've had a, you, you've had a good win of some kind and your client thinks you hung the moon. And this is the moment to ask them about that stuff. Um, I do. I am a believer in uh, online reviews being useful. I mean, we all use them when we shop all of the time. Probably a little bit less for a, a law firm that represents clients for long periods of time rather than shorter cases, um, just because you don't need that many new clients, you know, like, and businesses tend to probably, like general counsel and people like that that are hiring lawyers might use a slightly different rubric, but still always useful. Um, so that's how I would handle that. But I, I, the answer is, the short answer is, you would do both and do the other stuff at the end. I'm curious, Nikia, what, uh, um, I guess, what are you, th what are you thinking uh, to take to Nicole and Sabrina? Just, uh, I guess, what has, from what Eric's talked about, maybe resonating as some KPIs that you might say, hey, maybe we can start tracking this or, trying to incorporate some of these things? Well, so right now we're, we're basically, if anything, looking at overhead. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And for the most part, it's, can we pay all of our bills and pay ourselves? That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of where we are right now. Um, I think case management was um, at the, the, the top of my mind. Um, so that would probably be, one that I would consider prioritizing. I feel like the client satisfaction one is a very easy one. <laughs> it's, either, it's either easy or hard. <laughs> and, so and so I'm gonna go with easy. Um, so I, I definitely think that we can figure out, you know, something to do with the net prom promoter score um, somewhat easily, um, but the case management part is gonna be a little bit of a challenge for us. Yeah. And, you know, like all of those are great and they're all important, but I think if where your heads are at is like, hey, we've got to figure out how much we're spending on overhead and how much we're able to spend on us and how the basic finances of the firm are working out for everybody. I do think that's the place to start. Like you may as well start with the thing that's on everybody's mind and like get one or two things Taking care because it's going to be a lot easier to get all three of you lined up uh, on counting something that everybody is everybody cares about right now. You have a moment where this is this is the number one priority, and that's partially what this is about is getting aligned to your priorities. It's like client satisfaction will still be there in six months, nine months, you know. Um, and once you start getting stuff set out, you'll uh, it'll make it easier to get to the next one. And and I'll. That makes sense. And I was also going to share collections isn't you uh, recommended that we start with collections and uh, uh, client satisfaction. Collections is not really an issue for us because 99% of what we do is is pre build. Um, we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're working on retainers. <laughs> and so for the most Great. part, we're, we're not going over what is in Great. <laughs> in trust. <laughs> so that that's, that's awesome. That that helps. That helps, I think. So that yeah, makes that, sure. that's, that puts yeah, that one in, the, in the simple bucket. <laughs> And that's, that's the beauty of this is like, th there's not a, a right or a wrong here. Like your KPIs are just going to, they might be different than Tia's and whoever else is in the cohort. And it's like, and you need to put on your dashboard what you need in order to drive this car down the road safely and quickly. I've, I've got a question just, um, uh, Eric, how would, yeah. do you have a simple way to define salary overhead and profit kind of the three big buckets you know to, to define them 
Yeah, or to to find them, or to dif- differentiate, um, like yeah. just just kind of back of the envelope, just simple. Like, how would you explain yeah. it to a fifth grader or a simple attorney? Yeah, like let me, me tell you how I think about it, which is that simple because I was an English major and nobody lets me do complicated math. So I, I actually put a four. Like, I, I think of every dollar that comes into a law firm. I think that that's the basic economic unit, right? And then I think about how you divide up a dollar, and everything else sort of extrapolates from that. I think of it as four different categories, or sometimes I'll say four different buckets. So bucket number one is how much does it cost for you to get the legal work done? This is you you as a lawyer doing the work. So let's just assume you're in a one person firm now. And so you're going to wear all of these hats. Like, so the question is like, what would you have to pay an associate to do this work? So if it's a, you know, a ten thousand dollar case, like what would and you were paying an associate, uh, you know, fifty percent of it, they would take five thousand dollars of of that ten thousand. Okay, um, so that's the first, and I I call that production. Like, what what is the cost of legal production? Okay, the second piece I would get, I'll call business development. You might call it sales or marketing, but it's what is the that what percentage of the dollar is taken up with acquiring the client. Okay, and so that could include everything from advertising costs and web design and and that kind of stuff. Um, And it might be very small in a law firm or it might be really large. So like PI firm, personal injury firms tend to have pretty large marketing costs that cost a lot to acquire one of those clients. They get on TV, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, you know, all that kind of stuff. Other law firms, like a a law firm that represents business clients and has a stable roster of clients year over year, might have marketing costs that are a really small percentage, might be two or three percent or something like that. It's like you have to keep a website up, you take some people to lunch, you get some referrals, you know, easy peasy. Um, So that's the second bucket. The third bucket is overhead. That's everything that's not acquiring the client or doing the work. That's office space, keeping the lights on, malpractice insurance, technology, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody, the cost of any uh, personnel that's a non-billing personnel. So if you have to put somebody at the front desk to be a receptionist that doesn't do any client work, that goes into overhead. If you have a paralegal that bills out to clients, that becomes part of the production cost. Okay. So there's your first three buckets. The last bucket, and this is the bucket that gets short shrift, which is why I I say it to last from a lot of lawyers, is profit. And this is how much is left over out of each dollar that the firm owner gets just for having done the things of taking the risk of starting the law firm and owning the law firm. This is not what you not money that you make because you're great at developing business and people refer to you it's not money you make for managing the firm it's not money you make for um being a lawyer in the firm this is just the money you make like if you stop doing everything and just own the firm how much profit is there and so i like to when i'm trying to think about this and you guys are going to work through your your finances and so it might be a little bit early for you to, to do this, but the sooner you can start to figure out how to put some percentage of profit in each dollar, the happier you all will be. And I, I think as an aspirational target, like as a down the road, you might try to get to 15% profit. And then you have three partners and it's like, so you can divide up that profit among the three partners as you all see fit 5% each or whatever. It's a, play, it's a target to shoot at. Sometimes law firms can't get there. Sometimes they make more profit than that. But those are my four buckets. So profit, overhead, production, and marketing or business development. Good. That's thankful. Uh, that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and I guess the um, like benefits in terms of you know health insurance and retirement, 401k match, um, that would really go in the overhead or, well, or maybe that's a question, yeah. If that's a question, um, I'd say if it goes to attorney compensation, it goes into production. It's whatever you have to pay the attorney is gonna be production work. If it goes into um, a non-billing person, then it will go into overhead. Other benefits would go into into overhead. 
Um, but it just like it depends on on who it is you're talking about as you're trying to sort this out. It costs, you know, like if it costs you sixty thousand dollars to hire an associate and then you know the benefits cost another twenty K on top of it, your total comp on that associate's eighty K, that's product that's what it really costs you to produce it. <laughs> Eric, um, I do have a lawyer's mutual as my provider. So oh, great. Um, I'm wondering um, what services it is that you provide. So I do um, uh, over here, you can see, I just clicked over so you can see how to schedule with me. Like the, the main thing I do with our insureds is we offer three free um, consultations on any topic in the zone of practice management that you want each year. So I'm happy to meet with you or with you and another firm member if you have like a partner or whatever. Um, so I talk with folks about all this kind of stuff that we've talked about today, but it's a lot of technology, marketing, management, whatever is on their mind, but it, it's a, an hour at a time, one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. I do them mostly by Zoom, but but not always um, to, to talk through and like to, to drill down on your particular, as opposed to a presentation, just sort of talking about the concepts to try to drill down on the, the things that you need to talk about. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, you, my email and you can, and phone are up there. Uh, but Calendly is the easiest way to get on my calendar. It's always updated with, um, my availability. So I'd be happy to chat with you. Do you yeah, offer? Uh, sorry, do you offer uh, same or similar services for people who have different <laughs> carriers? Um, so I, I don't currently do it in North Carolina for anybody who's not in Lawyers Mutual. I do do private consulting for folks outside of Lawyers outside of North Carolina. Um, I'm happy if you have a question about it. I'm happy to to chat with you and. Um, either make a referral or we can do, I'm sure we can nibble around the edges or something. Yeah, the, uh, no, Eric's a great resource for North Carolina attorneys that have lawyers mutual, but I guess, uh, well, I guess you could have uh, Sabrina or Nicole, or Nicole contact Eric and, and we'd be on a consulting basis, I guess, since they're uh, non-North Carolina attorneys, um, but, is that was that part of the arrangement with North Carolina's mutual? You couldn't just to not compete with mutual. I it, it's not. They're really they're they're really flexible and they're they're a great client. I just try to. It gets muddy when I'm talking to North Carolina lawyers, and I don't ever want the folks from Lawyers Mutual to feel like I'm trying to uh, use their insurance as a lead generation thing for my own business. Um, so. I, Lawyers Mutual pretty much only operates inside the state, so I've kept it clean, clean for myself by just not doing this in the state with folks. Um, but I'm happy to, like, we could also, uh, if it's useful for your group, I'd be happy to come back some at some point and just do, like, uh, an unstructured Q&A or, or what. I'm happy to find some way to to help you all out. Um, that will That will work. But you don't want to, you know, do it as private clients. It can get expensive. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, no, this is wonderful. Thanks. You're so, you're very, you're very generous with your information and generous with your time. And you, you have a lot of good insight into how the practice of law uh, runs as a business <laughs> and uh, serves clients and helps people. Well, so. thanks. And I appreciate you inviting me to come talk with you. I've, all, I've been very impressed with what you've done with the incubator. It's always a pleasure to get to talk to the groups of folks who come through here. You're an inspiring uh, group of folks to to always to meet with. Um, and I still miss being in Durham a little bit, so it makes me feel like I'm back there. So, um, well, but, I, I did uh, have I did yeah. have one final question, and yeah. uh, I did want to finish before one o'clock. But uh, yeah. the ABA just came out with a new model uh, ordinance. So if you uh, model you rule, it? model rule, yeah, on. Uh, uh, flat fees uh paid in advance and like my assumption i mean is north Car do you do you get a is north carolina going to ignore that or are they gonna do you think they're gonna consider i have to look at that? it before i can answer that i'll say that um we have a, uh we we often will will follow the model rules but not always and we have um uh 
a decent number of rules already on fees in North Carolina. So I'm sure they'll be considering it. But one thing I, I do want to come back to since I don't practice law anymore. And anytime we get near professional responsibility, I always try to refer that out to some smart lawyer who spends all their time doing this stuff instead of me butchering it. Um, so there is a lawyer I like a lot um, in Raleigh named Josh Walthall, who does a lot of uh, professional responsibility stuff with uh, my clients and with lawyers mutual stuff. Um, so I would recommend you invite him to, to come talk to your group. He's awesome. He really knows his stuff. And I'm sure he would be willing. He's really generous with his time. The art, artful, artful answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> How not to commit malpractice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I'll go on record that I, I don't like that, this new model rule. And I haven't I think, even read it yet, actually. I think North Carolina has a good, I like the way North Carolina handles fees, fees earned upon receipt flat flat fees earned upon receipt and the uh the model rule is i think taking a step backwards and it's going to hurt attorneys what's the clients. what's the gist of it the gist of it is that um the as i understand it the you can no more you can no longer put flat fees earned upon receipt in an operating <laughs> account you have to put it in a trust account and it's oh, going really? to create uh, create um, additional work and it, it basically is pushing every back body back into an hourly billing yeah. mindset yeah that's so exactly basically what that sounds like I, I read it as they're working off of this theory that the only thing that can be earned upon receipt is a true retainer which mm -hmm. which which basically isn't even for the services it's right. just you know to, like to reserve your time and so if you have a flat fee, it, it's not a true retainer if it's for the work done, and therefore they're saying it's just an advance. Right. Which which has to go into trust. So it's a little totally. bit of, little bit of a mess. I hope they <laughs> North Carolina. Yeah, it's surprisingly regressive, it. really. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to go read that. Now I'm depressed. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, join the club. Because uh, like it's, it's, it's repressive. It's regressive. It's a step backwards. I hope North Carolina ignores it. But well, you know, when they go through this process, let me just put in a bid for this to um, like you guys are members of the North Carolina bar. Um, when they go through this process, they open these things for public comment. Make sure you're a part of it you know send it like they actually do like whatever group is you know the committees that work on and stuff they do read the the feedback and everything they care so um make sure that it like you're not just a consumer of this product you are also a member of th this bar so make sure you're a participatory member well great i won't ask you any more questions but yeah no thanks okay well we're it's a pleasure end. seeing you <laughs> we're going to end on an up note here so thanks eric um that sounds great it's great so we'll see you all later and uh, have Thank a good you. day take care yeah. everybody thanks bye, -bye. bye now have a good one bye-bye eric that was great i i really appreciate uh what you do Oh, thanks. I, I always enjoy getting to come talk with your folks. Maybe one of these days we'll actually get to do it in person. Yeah, yeah. Some one day. <laughs> All right. You have a good afternoon. Take care, man. Bye, Bye now.